speaker is Mr. Michael Borden, and his topic is Vastu for Prosperity and Abundance. Mr. Michael Borden holds master's degree in architecture from Southern California Institute of Architecture, Los Angeles, California, and is a practicing architect. He has a doctorate in myonic science and technology from American University of Myonic Science and Technology. He's a graduate in sociology from University of California. He has studied traditional Vastu Shastra under the mentorship of Padma Bhushan, late Dr. Ganapati Sthapati of South India. He is affiliated professionally to the American University of Myonic Science and Technology. He has written a book, Vastu Architecture. And with a big round of applause, we welcome Mr. Michael Borden on stage. That's so great to follow Gayatri, Gayatri G. She did all the work for me. <laughs> it reminded me of when I first, uh, when my wife Karen and I first came to India to study with Ganapati Stapati. And uh, we, we scheduled a trip for four months, four, four weeks. And I thought that should be plenty of time. I should be able to learn enough in that amount of time. And so we, each day we, we would meet with Ganapati Sapati in his office for a, about an hour or two. And for three weeks, he talked about the philosophical basis of Vastu. And here I'd spent all this time and money to come to India, put my work aside, and, and I, I needed the technical, technical knowledge. But he insisted on you know, spending these three weeks just completely pounding this philosophical basis of the knowledge into me. And my wife, Karen, was just eating it up. She loved it. And I had the feeling at the end of that, finally, in the fourth week, he, started, he gave me the technical knowledge that I could use to apply this. But I had the feeling after those three weeks that he was wishing that Karen was the architect <laughs> instead because she was really loving the knowledge. All right, um, I'd like to thank the Art of Living Foundation for creating this atmosphere of peace and knowledge for this Vastu conference. Uh, my only wish is that my teacher, Dr. Vigana Patistapati, could be with us today to fill our hearts and minds with this great science of India. I've been asked to speak about Vastu for prosperity and abundance. And uh, when I, they told me this, I thought, oh my gosh, at least I'll have a good, the good attention of my audience. In <laughs> um, thinking about this notion of prosperity, it reminded me of an elder fisherman my wife and I met on the beach in Chennai years ago. He was clothed in only a loincloth and his sunbaked skin. He was collecting sand crabs, and he eagerly showed us his haul. As we walked back through his beachside fishing village, consisting of huts of tree trunks and palm fronds, we both agreed that our impression of this man was that he was deeply happy and at peace. I forgot to go forward here. This was the beach. This is the little Davy Temple on that beach. On the other hand, I'm sure many of us have known friends or acquaintances that have plenty of money in life, abundant with possessions, but are clearly not happy or at peace. Vastu is not really focused on material prosperity or abundance. I hope that doesn't shock you or surprise you. The main goal of Vastu science is resonance. The Vastu technologies give us methodologies to align our consciousness with the laws of nature. This resonance with natural law, this alignment, brings peace and awareness of eternal truth. This is the abundance that Vastu science supports. Let me share this quote from my Vastu guru, Dr. V. Ganapati Slapati. 
In the heart cave of the body, there is inner space. And in the inner space, there is the vibrant thread of consciousness. This thread of consciousness that functions as the string or sarira vena of the bodily, bodily instrument. The structure of the Vastu-inspired building vibrates with cosmic energy and the bodily instrument resonates with this vibration. To create and offer the house of supreme bliss and to enable us to experience that supreme bliss here in this mundane house itself, these are the prime motives of Vastu science. In 1998, my wife Karen and I had the good luck to attend a performance of Indian temple dance in our hometown at the time in the United States. During the presentation, the artist mentioned she had recently performed in Kerala at a conference on Vastu science. When I heard this, it was like a door had just opened for me. I spoke with a dancer after the performance and asked if she knew any Vastu architects in India. She assured me that she knew the father of Vastu architecture in Tamil Nadu and gave me his contact information. When we went home that night, we immediately called Ganapati Stapati's office and we were able to get right through to him. In our conversation, we discovered that he was visiting a temple near us in the Midwest within just a few weeks. It was this first meeting at a temple in the United States that, sorry, in temple in the United States that brought a wonderful opportunity into our lives. By the end of that happy meeting, we had agreed to make our first trip to India to study Vastu with Stapati. In this brief presentation, I'll outline the technological and philosophical principles of Vastu science as applied to buildings for secular functions like houses and offices, as taught to me by my teacher, Dr. V. Ganapati Stapati. My hope is to encourage you to cultivate a desire through understanding to create a Vastu structure for your home or office. My studies in Vastu have focused mainly on understanding the technological application of Vastu principles, how to design the structure. For the deep spiritual foundation of Vastu theory, I have to refer you to Stapati's generous legacy of writing, such as the building architecture of Stapachaved, temples of space science, Indian iconography, and the translation of the Antirum of Mayan. My aim today is to give you a simple overview of the technical applications of Vastu knowledge that Stapati shared with me over my years of study with him. This information has been researched and verified by myself and my fellow students since we started this work in 1998 with Stapati in Chennai. This talk represents my best effort at presenting a conservative and reliable version of what I have learned of how to apply the technological principles of this ancient science in order to create what we call the Vastu effect. My motivation for these studies comes from the personal experience of seeing my life and the lives of my clients benefit from creating a relationship with Vastu knowledge and buildings. I believe Vastu science provides the technology to create buildings with the regenerative properties of inner silence, peace, prosperity, and good health. I'd like to say just a few words about my Vastu guru. Stapati came from an illustrious family of temple architects and sculptors. His family lineage stretches back centuries, including the Vastu architects who designed and created the, uh, and built the great Brihadeshwar temple of Tanjore which is a treasure of Indian art and architecture. Stapati is the son of Sri Vijanatha Stapati, a renowned sculptor and Sanskrit scholar. Those who have made the pilgrimage to Sri Ramana Ashram in Tirvanamalai can recall the artistic expressions of Stapati's father in the form of the mother's shrine and the astonishing life-size sculpture of Sri Ramana. 
This is a photo of Stapiti and his chief sculptor, Paramal, working on the face of the Tiruvallavar statue, the one in Kanyakumari. Stapiti dedicated his life to doing research and work in the field of Vastu science and technology. He was responsible for the resurrection of the works of the great Brahmarishi Mayan, who was the progenitor of this Indian science and technology, and a great influence on India's rich civilization and culture. In his life, Stapati earned a number of titles and awards, including an honorary fellowship in the Indian Institute of Architects, the National Award for Master Craftsmanship, the title of Shilpi Guru of India, and the Padma Bhushan Award, which recognizes distinguished service to the nation. He brought Vastu science to the world, sharing his knowledge worldwide. This brilliant, vibrant, brilliant and vibrant researcher, sculptor, architect, and philosopher, and scientist regenerated this ancient tradition of sacred architecture. And I acknowledge this with deep gratitude. The term Vastu is derived from a word meaning to dwell, to live. Ganapati Stapati expanded that definition to be that which lives forever. He said, if you take the universe and crush it into a drop, that is Vastu. This Vastu is the abundance, is the substance which is eternal. There is a technical term in Vastu science, Sunyambaram. The translation is spirit pure or pure consciousness. Sunyambaram is the source of all substance. Sunyambaram is that pure potential that gives rise to all essence. Stapati has described the universe as a bubble of Sunyambaram, oh, excuse me, as a bubble of rising essence in a sea of Sunyambaram. Actually, there are two definitions of Vastu. Vastu spelled with one A I just defined. I have the second Vastu spelled with two A's is that which issued out of the primal Vastu. The Vastu Shastras say that Vastu becomes Vastu. The phrase is Vastu Reva Vastu. This physical universe is Vastu, filled with forms expressed from that primal source in predictable and organized patterns, numbers, formulas. In Vastu science, Stapati said, we use God's measures to create. Now getting to how we define these formulas, this math of manifestation. The primal form, that entire universe crushed into a drop, the paramanu or subtle atom or energy atom that Gayatri referred to, the invisible seed of cosmic fire that exists within all forms, the life force within all. Paramanu is the source of all expression, the divine micro-being. The full expression of the cosmos, the universe, is the divine macro-being. Vastu structures are designed to resonate with these micro and macro structures, these geometries by using a formula or energy pattern called the Vastu Purusha Mandala. This is a Vastu Purusha Mandala. In Vastu science, this orthogonal mandala describes the path and pattern of energy manifesting into substance. How we apply this technology of design from, a principle, from this principle of the energy pattern of the Vastu Mandala I'll discuss shortly. This energy pattern is based on the cubical geometry of the Paramanu seed atom, the geometry which is at the core of all manifestation, including human beings. Stapati called it the geometry of silence. At the center of this seed atom, this chitsaba or hall of consciousness, is the thread of light, is a thread of light, the Brahma Sutra. This light is the Nataraja, the dancing form of Lord Shiva. This is the abundance that Vastu science inspires. 
a resonance with the primal law of silence, a resonance with Nataraja. Now I'd take, like to take the rest of my time to explain briefly the technical applications of Vastu principles. The basic elements for consideration are simple. They are site selection and orientation of the structure, the selection of Vastu Purusha Mandala for the structure, including the assignment of a specific unit of measure and proportion for the building, organizing the physical form of the building with respect to resonance with the Vastu Purusha Mandala, including room function allocation according to elemental energies, auspicious entry locations, assignment of all locations by aligning them with the Vastu Purusha Mandala, including the creation of a sacred energy center within the building, creating light lines through the structure, managing the location of any polluting elements or activities within the structure, and the creation of a protecting Vastu compound or wall. Also, we take into account the timing of the procession of the project by initiating action at auspicious times. Actions such as groundbreaking, the laying of foundation deposit, and entry upon completion. To achieve this resonance with natural law, the first step in creating a Vastu structure is to locate a suitable place on Earth for it. Vastu science considers the Earth a living organism which is embedded in the vibrant space and a part of the cosmic living body of the universe. When we place a Vastu structure on the earth, it's important that we honor the Mother Earth by giving attention to how and where we place the structure. The chief elements of site selection are orientation of the structure and the shape and orientation of the site, the general slope of the land and adjacent topography, the outstanding natural elements on the land, the relationship of the structure to the eastern horizon, the relationship with existing or potential roads, conditions of the soil, the existence of human created elements, and existing trees or shrubs on the land. In this presentation, I don't have time to go into detail on all these elements. The basic idea is to select a site that has good energy flow and solar aspect and a peaceful geometry and environment. The orientation of the Vastu structure is very important. Vastu science recognizes eight horizontal directions on the plane of the earth, north, south, east, and west, and the intermediate directions like northeast. We always choose to orient the structure facing one of the cardinal directions, north, south, east, or west. Each facing has unique influence on the occupants of the building. North facing brings wealth. South facing brings salvation and freedom from worldly desires. East facing brings physical comfort and mental peace. And west facing brings material growth and prosperity. In general, flat or gently sloping land is preferred for a Vastu structure. Land sloping down to the east, northeast, north, and northwest is also accepted for a Vastu site. It's recommended that the slope of the land is not excessive, not to exceed five to 10 degrees. A general rule is to place the house in an area where the eastern sun is not blocked. The ideal is for the structure to be exposed to the sun as it rises over the horizon in the morning. The next consideration for a Vastu structure is the Vastu Purusha Mandala. By applying the pattern of the Vastu Mandala, the architect controls the type and intensity of energy within the structure, creating a space that vibrates with positive energy. Let's look again at Avastu Purusha Mandala. For secular structures, we use the Paramashaika Mandala. In general, it's divided into concentric zones specific to the quality of energy predominant in that area. The Brahmapada is the zone of divine energy. The zone, this zone is the heart of the structure. 
The Devikapada is the zone of celestial energy adjacent to the Brahmapada. Stapati called it the field of luminosity. The Manushapada is the zone of human energy, the field of consciousness, and the Paisheshikapada is the zone of mineral energy, the field of gross matter. The outer two zones, Manusha and Paisheshika, are ideally the areas in which the mundane activities of daily life take place within the structure. Here is a detail of the Vastu Mandala showing the locations of the Devatas, or laws of energy, that we regard in terms of structuring the physical building. Also detailed are the location and effects of main door entries on each side, indicating the auspicious locations that need to be used, marked by the arrows. So we build the walls and roof of a building by aligning the structural elements of, with this sacred geometry of the mandala. By doing this, we enclose universal space and the structure gains a life energy. Just as the light atom within our human heart structure gives us the ability to resonate with universal source energy, the man-made Vastu building, by using the energy pattern of the Vastu mandala, has a structural geometry that resonates with source energy that gives it life. This resonance endows the building with an atmosphere of vibrant peace. So once we have chosen the Vastu Mandala for the structure, we need to give it a precise dimension, a precise perimeter. This perimeter is measured in Vastu units. The number of Vastu units adding up to the perimeter is determined by the Ayati calculations. These ancient formulas associated number with quality. Different numbers and thus different Vastu Mandala perimeters produce specific qualities and effects. Just like when a craftsman is creating a high quality musical instrument by following the correct geometry and dimensions, we assign a Vastu Mandala geometry and correct dimensions to the structure. There are many different prescribed units of measure that can be used by a Vastu architect, but the main unit we use is the Kishkuhastam, expressed in imperial measures that's two feet nine inches. Another unit we often use is the angular unit, which is one and three-eighths of an inch. For example, 55 uh, is an auspicious Ayati number. If we use Kishku Hostum, 55 times two feet nine would give a perimeter value of the mandala of 151 feet three inches, or 37 nine and three-quarters of an inch on each side of a square mandala. So once we have the Vastu Mandala dimension, we can go on to the other considerations of the building design. Entrance locations are very important in Vastu design. The main entry is the location of the formal entry door for the structure, the entry for the owners at the front of the building. Looking at the diagram of the mandala, we see the locations of the Pada Devatas and the general ed energetic effect on humans related to entrance at each location. It's said that crossing the threshold at that particular pada is a recognition and stimulation of the energy of that location. There are nine padas that are accepted as auspicious for primary entry of the structure. We can see, for example, on the east side, accepted locations are the Indra pada for greatness, conferring greatness, and the Jayanthapada conferring victory. When we cross the mandala perimeter into the space of the building, we are coming into relationship with the building. Our energy and the energy of the building begin to commingle and influence each other. An important note on this is for these positive influences to be active, the orientation of the Vastu mandala must be correct in terms of the cardinal points of the compass. One side note on this is that in a structure where there is a need for a second primary entrance, say an entrance from a garage perhaps, uh, that door should also be chosen from one of the primary door locations, the nine primary door padas. 
We have discussed orientation, Vastu Mandala, correct dimensions, and entry locations. The next protocol in design has to do with lines of light through the structure. Once the main door is established in the floor plan, the designer should create a clear line of sight through the structure to an opening on the exterior wall on the upper, opposite side of the building. This is called the thread of light of the house. The thread of light is achieved by proper room and wall plate layouts and the use of doors and interior windows, if necessary. The reason for this first line of sight through the structure is so that the house can breathe freely. It is said that the path is like a trachea or windpipe for the house. The reason for, okay, we got that. So um, the Vastu structure also requires two additional lines of light through the building, the Brahma Sutra and the Soma Sutra. The Brahma Sutra is the line of sight directly through the center of the Vastu Mandala from the front of the house to the back. The Soma Sutra is the line of sight directly through the center of the Vastu Mandala, perpendicular to the Brahma Sutra. Brahma Sutra is always related to the facing direction of the house. One final light pathway for the structure is from above. There should be a light coming into the central area of the building from a skylight or open patio or clear story windows. This can be for the topmost floor only. Room function locations within the Vastu structure are simple. The Vastu mandala is divided into nine equal parts, and here you can see the areas of the mandala with the locations of the elemental energies within the building. The center one-ninth of the Vastu mandala, the Brahmasthan, is the heart of the house. The building is flooded with energy at the Brahmasthan, and from there the energy spreads throughout the structure. Enclosed space in the Vastu structure is not empty space. It's filled with a luminous and subtle substance. This vibration of energy at the core of the building is a process of manifestation from subtle to gross. As the energy moves from subtle pure energy to gross material form, it begins to take on attributes. Attributes or elements begin to manifest and gather in a prescribed arrangement. In the Brahmasthan, the subtle space element manifests from the center, the energy spreads out to the corners of the Vastu Mandala. Each of the four gross elements, fire, earth, air, water, manifest in designated areas, fire in the southeast, earth in the southwest, air in the northwest, and water in the northeast. So each area of the Vastu Mandala has prescribed functions recommended relating to these elemental influences found there. So um, I'll just quickly go into this. Southeast, we know, is for the kitchen, and the kitchen uh, cooking area should be on the southeast wall, on the south, on the east wall, in the second pada, the Antariksha pada. Stapati told me that cooking in this location facing east has a very beneficial influence for the mistress of the house. The luminary of the pata affects the nervous system of the person cooking there. The effect is to stimulate righteousness and right action, action in accordance with the laws of nature. And southeast can also be used for study, office, and machinery or mechanical room or heating room. Southwest is for uh, the earth element and the influence brings heaviness, calmness, coolness. It's a good location for the master of the house to have a bedroom and also for the husband or wife to have an office. But you can also have a living or family room there, library, and it's a second location for the meditation room. Northwest is the Vayu element, air element, the influences of movement. So in older houses, as Gayatri pointed out, it used to be the granary, the storage place where things would move through there. In modern times, we use it as a bedroom for guests to keep them moving <laughs> or for uh, elder children who will soon be leaving the house. Um, but it can also be used for many other functions. Uh, northeast is the water element and the influence of that is fertility and power. Puja and meditation rooms are best located there, but it can be used for 
uh, an office for the owners or a bedroom library or study. I don't think I'll go into the intermediate directions, but the intermediate directions, the central areas, those are, have a lot of flexibility. They can be used for bedrooms, offices, living rooms. Um, but I will talk about the Brahmasthan. Brahmasthan is the sacred center of the structure. The Vastu energy is generated in that area and spreads outward through the structure. Its function is to energize the building. The people living there can use this area to walk through to reach other areas, and it can be used for short-term activities like celebration or gathering. It can be incorporated into a larger family room area, but the geometry of the Brahmasthan should be honored and occupied in a way that gives attention to that. It's best if the center of the Brahmasthan is kept clear. And each floor should honor the Brahmasthan, all the way from the ground to the attic. Uh, I won't go into, since we're running out of time, I won't go into uh, the location of polluting elements like stairs or toilets. If you have questions, you can come up to me personally and I can talk to you about that. Wells, we all know, are supposed to be in the Northeast. And... Um, I think that's about it. I just I hope this presentation has inspired you and has given you a good introduction to the Vastu, to the principles of Vastu architecture. Simply put, there is a subtle life essence or energy pervading the universe, underlying all forms. This under manifest essence is the foundation of all energy and substance. Life springs from essence in prescribed pathways or formulas, and Vastu science used these formulas to create highly vibrant and healing spatial forms. I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to share this important knowledge with you, and again to encourage you to appreciate the passion and kind generosity of my teacher, Dr. V. Ganapati Stapadeh.